Welcome to the April edition of the Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week web series. My name is Sarvat Nasser and I'm a senior reporter at The National. I've been covering the UAE space program since 2014, as well as the global commercial space industry and interplanetary mission. And I'm happy to be your moderator today. Last year, the world watched as billionaires took to the skies and launched themselves into space. The race to space has become a bit of a phenomenon, giving the ordinary person a potential opportunity to take an extraordinary space flight. But there's more to space than meets the eye. Space through research and science improves people's lives around the world by contributing to things like environmental monitoring, natural resource management, weather forecasting, climate modeling, and early warning systems to assist in minimizing future disasters. I'm happy to be joined today by Kalfan Arhamati, Strategic Research Specialist at the UAE Space Agency and Dr. Abdul Halim Jalad, Professor at the National Space Science and Technology Center at the UAE University. This, this session will aim to shed light on how researchers and scientists are using space technologies here on Earth to better our daily lives and some of the challenges and opportunities we face in maintaining long-term sustainability in space. So I think the first question is, why is space important to our life here on Earth and how do we rely on space applications for our daily activities and in particular to make our lives here on Earth more sustainable? I think we'll start with you, Mr. Kalfan, if you'd like to share your thoughts with us. Thank you, Sarah. So space is a really important pillar in our daily life. In space, we have uh, uh, the downstream applications. It's applications that use data that are received from space, such as imagery data or uh, GPS data, to serve these applications on ground. So we use different types of data, like we use uh, uh, SAR data, which is synthetic aperture radar data, to analyze the deformation of the ground. This helps us to, uh, to monitor infrastructure and uh, uh, <clears throat> infrastructure and like oil pipelines and energy infrastructure to sustain them and to help, uh, to help the government to maintain them on the long term. Also, we have the GPS data where we uh, use this GPS system to uh, now in everything in our life, we use Google Maps, we use delivery applications. This all, uh, all map depends on the GPS uh, data to recognize the location of the uh, user and uh, to deliver things for her to take him to the destination he would like to go. <clears throat> right, that's fascinating. I, we all use GPS, so I think we, we, we pretty much know how important that aspect of, of, of our lives are, is having the GPS and make sure we can navigate, and satellites help so much with that. Um, Dr. Abdul, your, your thoughts on that? So these are, as so what Khalfan mentioned, are, are really the two uh, most critical, uh, critical applications of space, which is really Earth observation and geolocation. Uh, now, there are uh, some details that can be actually deduced from these two main primary uh, applications. Uh, so there are things like uh, uh, urban planning, uh, uh, monitoring uh, forestry, dissertation. In fact, uh, in fact, uh, the UN have actually uh, do have actually produced a sustainable roadmap, sustainability roadmap for 2030. It's called sustainable. Uh, development goals for 2030, and they have actually categorized uh, 17 key uh, elements, uh, which are the goals for, for uh, and th this has been approved in 2015 by all of the states, uh, member states of the United Nations, in which they have categorized these are the main sustainability goals, and space as you, uh, uh, appears to be playing a very important role in, in these, including uh, in, uh, uh, helping fight poverty through you know, monitoring uh, crops, uh, crop cultivation, and uh, desert, uh, desertification, and all of these kinds of things that affect really uh, poorer areas around the world. Also, we have applications, uh, currently recent applications, including communications, for example, with you know the private sector, including you know Starlinks, uh, SpaceX, and others. They are focusing on providing internet uh, and communication to areas that are not really previously have been covered. Uh, by the you know the normal uh, internet connection, uh, which actually helps in uh, improving and you know uh, connecting these uh, remote areas to 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 the rest of the world. Uh, there are many uh, applications, you know, including uh, including for example monitoring life on land, uh, um, uh, 
habitants, uh, habitat monitoring, and all of these kinds of so that, you know, I mean, there are, you know, in each of these 17 uh, sustainable uh, development goals defined by the UN, you will find that space will play an important role. Right. And the Starlink is a great example. I mean, we read so much about that and how that's sort of expanding. Um, uh, the second question, and uh, it's more elaborating on, on the, uh, sorry, expanding on the first, um, space exploration and satellites drive a lot of innovation. How has science and technologies developed for use in space been repurposed for use here on Earth? So basically talking about some of the spin-off technologies that have been developed over the years. And not just by satellite data, but also interplanetary missions and uh, some, some other space explor exploration missions that have taken place over the years. Uh, Mr. Kalfan, if you'd like to start. Yes, so I think like there is a lot of applications and uh, tools that have been uh, spent out from the space to, uh, to ground. I would like uh, uh, to emphasize on uh, three of them. Uh, so the first one is the water recycling, uh, uh, water recycling uh, <clears throat> systems and the life support systems. So uh, water is limited in space. So there are uh, technologies that start from space to uh, recycle the waters and fluids from a human body to create water out of it again. There is also the uh, life support system have also other tools that uh, recycle the the air. Uh, so when uh, it takes, uh, as I said, also air is a limited resource in space. So when astronauts breathe, these systems will take out the CO2 and also to recycle it to have again the, the oxygen and uh, <clears throat> more uh, it pressurize the uh, spacecraft to help them to live. So these systems are used now on ground. There is also uh, something that is trending now, which is the fuel cell. So the fuel cells also now they're trying to use it on uh, in marine applications. So they, uh, the, these fuel cells take uh, hydrogen and uh, oxygen, and their chemical uh, in their chemical uh, <clears throat> operations, and then they they have the output as water. So they're trying to find new application for it in, in, mari in marine time and uh, uh, remote uh, oil uh, oil rigs. Uh, so I think there's also a, a, a lot of other applications that could be used uh, and tools to be used on ground. Uh, but uh, right. yeah. uh, three, three main that uh, like affecting us today for water, uh, oxygen and uh, energy. Sure, yeah, those are definitely important ones. And I think we think a lot about the International Space Station uh, when we think about spin-off technology, especially. Um, Dr. Abdul, do you, what, what, what's on your mind? So this is actually one of my favorite questions because we keep on getting asked this question. Okay, you're working in space, we're spending all of this money, whether here in the UAE or abroad in, in the US, you know, NASA accounts for you know, a lot of the budget. I think it's 0.5% of the total GDP. Our total national budget uh, and people ask is it worth the money but uh, you know from my experience now in the space in this area uh, this spin-off uh, spin-off uh, technologies that come out of space are actually what makes it worth it uh, there are things that we are using every day and we don't notice it and they come up come up come come from space technology so space technology we are actually you know if you're if you're imagining we're going to deep space now there's a new there's the uh, mission to uh, so there was the Mars mission, and then now we are going further into deep space, uh, even further. Uh, the technologies that are required in going to deep space, for example, now we require things that are, you know, we're going into areas where, which doesn't have much uh, sunlight, so we have to develop uh, solar panels that are more efficient. We are developing, you know, huge, uh, huge uh, areas of solar panels, and we have to deal with them. Uh, there are. Uh, technologies that are related to uh, artificial intelligence. Now we are actually sending things, something to really deep space. So you'll have to come up with uh, uh, more technologies that are actually allow the spacecraft to, to, to act uh, remotely without intervention from, from Earth. Uh, so we say that you know the, the need is with, with what brings actually innovation. So if you are actually imagining that you would like to land something on the moon within an area of one kilometer square, you'll have to invent the technologies 
the computational power and you know the, the propulsion system that is able to land that spacecraft uh, on on the on uh, on the moon or on Venus or wherever uh, with high accuracy. Uh, out of that, we have you know historically got you know several uh, inventions that Khalfan mentioned. Some of them uh, there are many that we don't even think about, like you know the uh, LASIK technology that I did LASIK last last year, and you know LASIK technology is uh, something that has come up from uh, ladder. Uh, technologies used for autonomous uh, uh, docking of space space stations with the International Space Station or with other other spacecraft. Uh, you have increased uh, efficiency of the solar panels. Even the computer mouse has come out of NASA. Uh, people don't know that artificial intelligence and machine learning has actually developed a lot uh, due to space and due to research within the space industry. So if you are actually targeting, you know, getting if you are if you are actually uh, increasing the bar of your aims and the bar of your goals, you are able actually, in order to reach that particular goal, you will have to come up with solutions. And these solutions happen to be very useful here on Earth. I think the third and final question for today is space itself suffers from a sustainability, sustainability problem. To ensure the long-term sustainability of outer space activities, what should the governments as well as the private sectors be doing? Uh, Mr. Kulfan, if you'd like to go ahead with that. Sustainability is, <clears throat> sustainability is an important uh, pillar for the UAE Space Agency. We've, uh, we've been working on several programs and uh, also uh, technical programs and policy and regulation programs to create this kind of sustainability on the space sector. So we're, look, we're looking forward to create more usable uh, space, uh, space uh, tools and technologies so uh, we're looking forward uh, how to be more uh, sustainable and how to use space to sustain Earth uh, in several applications. And we're proud to, uh, to cooperate with the National uh, Space Science Technology Center and several of these programs. And uh, we can see now a lot of scientific breakthroughs that helps to sustain uh, space, such as the reusable launch pads and uh, moreover reusable uh, satellite parts also. Right, okay, yeah, reusable launch pads. That, that sounds quite fascinating and interesting as well. Uh, Dr. Abdul, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so, so uh, I think there are two aspects for this, this question. First, well, firstly <laughs> is appreciating the, the level of the problem and you know, uh, uh, having governments uh, uh, you know, increasingly understand that this is going to be an, an increasing problem with time. Uh, and then the second is to uh, try to figure out ways to solve it. So uh, with the first point, which is appreciating the problem, uh, you know, I, I do know, I do understand, and I have spoken to several regulatory bodies around the world, and all specifically here in the UAE, uh, represented by the US Space Agency, and there's a continuous appreciation of the problem. Now we. We, we, we have to understand that this is going to be a big problem in the future. So if you, if you look into the statistics in 2020, you had around 1,300 uh, satellites has been registered. And this accounts for 10% of the total number of satellites that has been launched in the past uh, 10 years. Uh, we are expecting you know, these numbers to continue increasing with, you know, we, we did talk about Starlinks before. Starlinks is, is planning 1,200 uh, satellites. You have also, uh, one web and many other constellations in which we're talking about mega constellations, satellite constellations. And this is going to pile up uh, the you know, debris, space debris that we have in space. And it's, uh, so there's also, I've, I've read that there is, the United Nations have estimated that we will have 70,000 satellites in orbit by 2050. And uh, so this is going to be a really a serious problem. And governments, not only governments, but also the private sector, you know, in order for them to protect their assets and their business, they have to also take this uh, seriously. Uh, and there is an increasing, I think, in my opinion, and I've seen that in the past at least uh, five to six years, there has been an increasing, you know, interest in this area uh, and in trying to, you know, uh, make some of these regulations uh, obligatory uh, on the uh, operator's uh, side. Uh, now, on, on, now we, if we know that there's, there's a problem and we appreciate that there's a serious problem here, then we come to the second point, which is really how to mitigate that and how to you know, solve this problem. So there are two way, two two different aspects here. One of them is you know how to avoid having the space debris in the first place. 
by enforcing maybe uh, the regulations uh, and you know there are there are certain aspects that, are, that this is actually the, the basic role of the of the government governments around the world and the United Nations is to find out solutions in order to avoid the space debris in the first place. Uh, the second part is basically finding technologies that will clean up the space to bring down the space debris uh, from space and uh, also other technologies that Khalfan also mentioned. So I've actually I did actually see a few companies startups that has come up in the last few years that actually are, are uh, specialized in figuring out methods of you know capturing space debris and trying to clean the space from 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 this space accumulating problem of space debris. Right. Yeah, I think uh, probably the number one topic uh, and issue that could uh, should be discussed when it comes to the the topic of uh, space sustainability is how to make it mitigate the problem of space debris, uh, which uh, governments and private sector should be looking into solving that problem before it gets completely out of hand. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Mr. Khofan and Dr. Jalad. Uh, it's been a very insightful conversation on how to make uh, space more sustainable. It has been a pleasure speaking with you. And a thank you to our audience for attending. We look forward to having you join us for the next episode of the ADSW web series.